doing a lot of that lately in the space of my role at the Studio Museum. So, I thought what we're going to do in my uh, allotted time is that I really want to talk a little bit about, as a curator, um, how I've become the curator I am, really through the projects and the places um, that I have occupied uh, that space. I say I'm a curator, though my title now, of course, is director, but I realize that, you know, even when I come back through JFK and I have to fill out that form, the customs form that says occupation, I still write curator, because essentially, that is what I think of when I think of who and what I am. Now, um, that's the one thing we have to do is uh, get the instructions. So where we begin, as was said, quite simply, I am the director and chief curator of the Studio Museum in Harlem, an institution founded in 1968 to present, preserve, interpret, and collect the work of African-American artists and artists of African descent. This is a work from our collection by the amazing Jacob Lawrence, a work called The Architect, um, depicting an architect, an African-American architect, but an iconic work for us because it really is about the idea of imagining, building, and creating. And that is so much what's at the core of the Studio Museum's life. As was said, we're on 125th Street. I'd like to tell people we are smack dab in the middle of the Apollo Theater to one block to our west, and President Clinton's office one block to our um, to the east. Uh, on the right is an image of the artist Dave McKenzie, one of our former artists in residence, who was at the Studio Museum in the years right after President Clinton uh, moved to 125th Street with his foundation and his offices. And after a New York Times article appeared asking Harlemites if they'd seen Bill Clinton, and many of them, of course, said no, Dave took it upon himself to rectify that by coming into the studio at the museum every day and putting on his Bill Clinton costume and walking. <laughs> Really, you know, and as I said, as I begin to think about how I understand the story of my life and my career in and around art, I have begun to realize that it no longer can be just thought about in terms of just simply the facts of my resume, but really it is about the artists and the artworks um, that have informed my path. In some ways, and I, I was thinking this today, that perhaps a year from now, the only way I'll be able to talk about what I do will be through artworks and artists themselves. That is the story, which in some ways feels, as I stand here now, as if so many things were inevitable, actually has been created around these very particular moments that have come together to get me where I am. And what makes me know that the most is the fact that I've always been deeply inspired by the work of the playwright Audrey Kennedy, and particularly her book, a sort of memoir called People Who Led My Plays. And so in many ways, you can think about the way in which I think about what I do is the people, the artists, and the artworks that have led my exhibitions. So, how I got here. Again, not how I got here, Delta, how I got here. For real. <laughs> Um, I grew up in a home where culture was acknowledged and loved and supported, but perhaps I did not have a sense of the actual physical qualities of real artworks. In our house, my mother had this print. It was a poster, I right? print, that's like a euphemism. It was a poster. Um, this, right, she called it a print. She would say, my Picasso print, you know, and I'd say to her, well, mom, I'm not sure. Exactly. But <laughs> she this poster, a Picasso Devil piece, something my parents bought like in the village and you know hung in our house. And to me, the, the jump from that to what actual art was was a big one. Right? Because I sort of grew up around the idea of things hanging on the wall but not necessarily understanding art. I grew up in Southeast Queens, and I grew up at the time when hip hop was being born. Now, you know, in many ways, um, I would love to be able to tell the story of how I spent hours in Daisy Park as LL Cool J and Run DMC were doing what they did, but I didn't. I was in my bedroom at home listening to Joni Mitchell, you know, reading you know, Bronte novels. But that being said, this was the context in which uh, I was created, and really, it was in fifth grade the very amazing independent school where I went, I had a teacher named Lucy Buck, an amazing woman, who taught us art history. And that's how I came to know that art was important to me. Also, at that very same time, the movie fame came out when I was in eighth, seventh 
seventh or eighth grade. And it was a transformative moment for me because what it made me realize was that I had absolutely no talent. <laughs> and what I realized about that, and it wasn't like a statement of like deep, you know, self-hate, it was truly that what I realized that as a young person, you could have talent and you could have a passion and you could pursue it in a single-minded way. And it really occurred to me that I had not felt that about something and I had not exhibited the ability to do that in a way. But I knew I felt that way in some ways about being around art and artists. So fame really changed my life because it allowed me as a very young person to feel that I could decide in that very moment exactly what I wanted to be and pursue it. Also around that same time, um, the movie version of the Broadway play, The Wiz, came out. Now, I'm sure many of you uh, have seen The Wiz with Diana Ross and Michael Jackson. I had seen the play. My parents were huge, huge theater buffs. Absolutely loved the theater, supported uh, African American theater in New York, the Negro Ensemble Company and others. But also, we went to many Broadway plays. So we'd seen The Wiz on Broadway. And when the film came out, of course, we went to see it. And that also was a transformative moment because it made me understand that there was a space in which you could imagine the world through the lens of blackness. And when The Wiz was in the theater and then came out, it was in the days before cable and DVDs, it would come on network TV, and again, this is when there were like five channels, and in New York it would come on channel nine, channel 11, <laughs> and pre-VCR, so like it came on, I had to just stop whatever I was doing to watch it, because you know, you can like DVR and save it for later. And I must have seen The Wiz a thousand times. I probably have now seen it a million times. And that combined with fame together at that very young moment really began for me to speak to what and who and where I thought I'd go. Very literally, my curating career began. Um, I have a brother who is a year younger than I am, and um, some friends of my parents, an apparently obviously childless couple, gave us a shared Christmas gift. <laughs> Must in some way 
involve being able to live in the space of art. And being as lucky as I was growing up in New York City, at that time, the world of the downtown Soho art scene was being created, and at the center of that was Jean-Michel Basquiat, who was receiving a level of attention and critical um, acclaim that again allowed me to connect art not just to objects, but to actual living, breathing creators. So I went to college, I went to Smith College, very Mona Lisa smile, there, yeah. art history major, that was in at Wellesley, but you know, you get the vibe. Um, and I was engaged with art history, certainly, but I still was so interested in this idea that of who the people were who actually made these things. I also, when I was in college, was introduced um, and really became passionate about the field of African American studies, and I was a double major. In those days, 100 years ago, in the 80s, um, there were no black artists in art history, and there really was not an attention to African American art in the study of African American studies and humanities. Now, that has all changed through the pioneering and amazing work of many scholars, too many to name. But at that time, I found myself moving between these two departments, trying to find, in a way, a whole that would define what would become the work I would do. To this end, I said to the modernist scholar um, who taught 20th century modernism and even a bit of contemporary at Smith College at the time, I went into his office and for my final paper, I said, I, I want to write something about black art. I want to fully engage and think about what black art means, what it can be, and I you know, created this argument in my mind, and he very, very, very sort of straight, you know, poker face, pulled a catalog off of his shelf, and it was a catalog of Frank, Frank Stella's black paintings, and he said, you want to write about black art? <laughs> I love being able to tell Frank Stella that story many years later. <laughs> I did not know exactly what all of that meant in those years, but I knew there was a world being created which was thinking about the art and culture world differently and creating a space for me to occupy. I knew that there had been people who had been rewriting the canon of American art to include the contributions of African American artists. I knew that there were women who were fighting for gender equality and parity in exhibition. I knew that there had been curators and critics and artists really creating the space for change. But I just, at that point, did not know where I would fit into it, but was so eager to find out. And the way that I found out was in the absolute positive gift that came to me in my second and third years at Smith College when James Baldwin, who'd been living in the south of France, came back to the United States and took a position um, in the five college areas, so at Smith College, Amherst College, Mount Holyoke College, Hampshire College, and UMass, and was a five college professor. And we all had the opportunity to study with James Baldwin. I feel incredibly privileged because I took a seminar with him, which included just 20 students, um, I had to, I sort of lied to get into the class, but you had to be a writer um, to get into the seminar, obviously, and it's James Baldwin, that, what, what, why wouldn't you have to be a writer? But I was so convinced that this would be the most important thing I could ever do, I was willing to figure out how my art history interest could move into writing. What I came to find out later, because of course in this course, uh, Jimmy gave me so many gifts, but I think that the reason I got into this was because, not because he thought I was going to be a writer or be a good writer, but it was because he ascertained early on um, that I was from New York City, but not just from New York City, but that my father was from Harlem. So through this class, which was meant to be a seminar, we had a reading list, and the reading list had dozens of books on it, and when Jimmy came into the first class, he looked at these books as if he'd never seen them before, and then he promptly ignored them and just started talking. And he'd come into each class and just start talking. And he would start with his own work, and then he'd move to the work of writers who inspired him or enraged him. Then he would move to his life experiences and sort of talk about the worlds in which he lived. And then he often sometimes would begin to reminisce about his childhood. And it's when he got to that place, he would begin to talk about Harlem of the 20s and 30s. And he would relate stories, but he would get to a place or a street, or a restaurant, and he would 
for a moment forget what he was going to say. And I, as if possessed by a spirit that I did not know, would know the names. And we would say things like, yes, and on Sunday, when we would leave my father's church, I would peek into the ballroom that was on 7th Avenue because people would be dancing. And he said, the ballroom was called. And I would just say, not knowing how I knew this, but I'd say, the Renny, the Renaissance. And I knew this because I grew up with these same stories. My father was born in Harlem in 1926. <laughs> went to elementary and middle school in the same school that Paul went to, walked the same streets, and basically almost told the same stories. So I knew them. I knew them all. And that created an incredible dialogue between Jimmy and I. And what it did is he gave me what, something that I had never claimed, and that was hard. He, he made me know how much that was a part of who I actually was and would be and become. He also um, was highly, highly supportive of my desire to be a curator and to work with artists. And he also gave me Buford Delaney in this, in this picture here with Jimmy Baldwin, with Norman Lewis in, in the background. You see, that's Norman Lewis. And what he told me about Buford Delaney made me understand what kind of curator I would need to be. So what Jimmy saw as a possibility was not an inactive academic pursuit, but one that would sort of take on the work that needed to be done to honor the artist who needed to be shown and understood. When I was young, my mother would always say, usually when it would be happening when I was standing in her way, when she was trying to do something, she would say, make yourself useful, right? I mean, she must have said this to me a hundred times a day. And Often, and I used to always kind of analyze that because it felt like it wasn't a sentence and I thought that couldn't be grammatically correct, I was like, what's the subject <laughs> object there? But she would just say it, and each one would have a period after it, make yourself useful, right? And that was a prompt to like, stop standing around and do something. And when Jimmy began to talk to me about artists like Buford Delaney, I thought about that, make yourself useful. And that, in many ways, is what I took and left with to become the curator that I am. I graduated from college, I, as I said, came to the Studio Museum in Harlem. That then became clear to me the place that the work that I needed to do would happen. Um, left the Studio Museum after a year when my internship was over and ended up at the Whitney Museum. And in that space, began to explore for myself what would be a narrative that has pretty much consumed me ever since. And that is, what story could I tell as a curator? How could I be not necessarily a steward or a custodian right, in a curatorial role, role, but a conspirator of a sort? How could I work with artists around the ideas to create exhibitions that opened up the space of dialogue and questions? And really, for me, this was informed by the work of three artists that if I made a hundred more shows, I still would be convinced that their influence on me would continue to be generative. And they are Adrian Piper, Robert Colescott, and David Hammonds. This is a trinity for me, and really the base from which much of my work has come from. Perhaps most significantly, as I said, in 1994, um, in those very early years of my career, in the kind of naivete, naivete that can come from you, I set out to make an exhibition looking at the ways in which conceptually based artists looked at the image of African American men as it had been defined through the space of media and pop culture from the late 60s until the present of 1994. This exhibition came on the heels of my working on the 1993 biennial. It also came at a moment where I was fully invested in a generation of emerging African-American artists, artists like Glenn Ligon and Warren Simpson and Lyle Ashton Harris and Carrie Mae Weems, artists now who deeply exist in mid-career, but at that time were all really beginning to find their voices and really uh, paving uh, new narratives in art. It was an exhibition in which I sought to explore the methodology of the an exhibition that looked at race. I thought if I could turn this sort of method around, and instead of making an exhibition of African-American artists,
is, could I make an exhibition that looked at race through contemporary art? Now, you know, the thing about exhibition making is that it really happens in your head for a long time. And in your head, you're the only one thinking about it, so everything makes sense. Everything is brilliant, even, in some cases. <laughs> it all works out. And what was so amazing to me is that Perhaps, again, a gift that I can claim now is making this show so early in my career taught me everything I know about not just making exhibitions, but the space that exhibitions can occupy in the public dialogue. When this exhibition opened up, um, this is a group of installation shots from the exhibition on view of the Whitney. It was at the Whitney in 94 and then went to Los Angeles to the Hammer Museum in the winter of 95. While this exhibition was on view, I certainly imagined that I understood in some ways what my life as a curator would be. But as the exhibition was on view, we used to have in New York City a talk radio station devoted to um, the African American community. And my father listened to it in his office every day. My father uh, was a lawyer and an insurance broker, and he kept this radio station on. And there were two hours at midday that were calling any topic. And from the day the show opened, people were calling in to protest the Black Mountain Exhibition. And each day the calls got more intense. And one day a caller called in to um, complain about the fact that the Whitney Museum had an exhibition about black men that was curated by a middle-aged Jewish woman named Thelma Golden. <laughs> Radical in the idea of the 